welcome to the From Survivor to Thriver podcast. I'm Mark Fernandes. Each week, along with my co-host Eric DeRosa, we aim to shatter the stigma around mental health conversations through kitchen table conversations with real and relatable people, all the while reminding our audience that they are not alone. There is hope, there is help, and there is a way through. Enjoy today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to From Survivor to Thriver, episode 107. The numbers keep getting bigger, and obviously that's what's going to happen. For some reason this morning when I, like, fired up the, the system and everything and saw that number, I, I had I was a bit taken aback, not in a bad way, but I was like, wow, we're not, like, just at 100. Like, we are well past 100, and, and I think we just scheduled episode, what, 122, Eric? like Something like that, yeah. Yeah, definitely in the early 120s. <laughs> well, for all of you listening, I should go ahead and introduce myself. This is Mark Fernandes, our co-host. And you just heard from our co-host, Eric DeRosa from Across the Creek. And as I've been doing lately, I've been bopping back and forth between all these different number things. And uh, this one from a number aspect, I had to do the athlete thing because there's three athletes that I didn't even have to look up that all wore the number seven that just popped up. And I'm just going to list them. And then... If Eric wants to chat about any of them, we can. But Mickey Mantle, Nate Tiny Archibald, and John Elway. So for those of you who listen, who are into American sports, Eric is already reacting. Look, we can talk about how not great of a human he is, but he's a remarkable athlete. Uh, he just reacted to John Elway Jr. Uh, we live in Col- Colorado, so we have to hear a lot about that guy, even though he was not someone we... But we should talk about Mickey Mantle and Tiny. So Nate Tiny Archibald literally was tiny. He was this, I would call him a jitterbug guard in basketball who played for the Celtics. I'm trying to remember, he won at least two championships. It may have been more than that. And then Mickey Mantle, obviously, number seven, bear and, and needs no introduction or uh, explanation, I think, to most people. But I, I think what a lot of people don't understand is, you know, our modern day athletes have huge advantages over the earlier athletes, especially from a medical standpoint, and Mickey Mantle essentially played the last 10 years of his baseball career with a horrific back and a knee that was barely holding on and still managed to put up the hugest numbers. And I just, I don't think, uh, if you've never seen the movie 61 chronicling his and Roger Maris's, you know, com- competition to get more than 60 homers, you really should. It's a great movie, great performances. And it really does shine a bit of a light on how hard it was for Mickey to play every day. And uh, so, yeah, there are the athletes. That's it. That's all we're going to do today. So I'm going to shoot it over. Eric, feel free to react now uh, vocally instead of just physically. <laughs> Good morning. Before I react. I, I didn't want to call you my ever disgusted co-host. Yes, but... <laughs> before, yeah, before I react, in especially in honor of our, our guest today, who we'll get to meet in a, in a few minutes, one of the greatest number sevens of all time, known around the world, in sports, David Beckham. And currently number seven, giving away where our guest is from today, is currently playing in this town. And he wears number seven. And it's uh, Cristiano Ronaldo. So some amazing footballers uh, who have worn that number. But well, one, and, one and, of my favorite is, is Beckham. Well, it makes sense because the list I use is actually USA Today. So yes. I might have to branch yeah. out, especially now that we're in football number category. Because seven, eight, nine, ten are usually some of the the best players on the field, right? I'm not the striker. Yeah, yeah, the strikers, the goal Strike, scorers. Yep. yep. But yeah, uh, how about that for an ignorant El- American talking <laughs> football? Huh? <laughs> Elway. Wow. Yes, amazing football player, horrible human being, and the uh, the Denver Broncos team that's been on the field for the last few years, which has floundered miserably, was uh, was was at his hands. But thankfully, the new ownership. Let him ride. Yeah, let, let's ride, right? Isn't that their, their motto now? Uh, uh, so that would they, be Russell they, Wilson's Russell motto. I don't so think they the rest let of him, the team is on it. They let him ride off into the sunset. So thankfully, other than some some pandering private jet commercials that I have to watch from time to time with John Elway, and we know we don't really have to hear all that much about him. And since he doesn't ski here, we don't have to see him. So quite lovely. Hey, how was your little getaway to Mexico? It was amazing. Yeah, it's funny. Everyone's like, wasn't it relaxing? And it, 
And for anyone who knows our friend who were down there celebrating her 40th birthday, that lady has no chill in her. So there was not much chilling, but it was relaxing in the fact that it was really just just having a great time, really like just focusing on having a great time, eating great food, tons of time at the beach, boogie boarding. I caught my first sailfish, which was wow. incredible and was was a uh, was a really uh, sort of humbling experience. How hot and was it? it? You know, it was actually, I would describe it as more humid than hot. So I was in the Puerto Vallarta area, which is obviously pretty damn close to the equator. But it is it is that time of the year and they just had a huge hurricane. Uh, about a week and a half ago. Thankfully, the area we were in did not have much damage. Um, You could see some like sand deposited well inland in certain places, and they had some river flooding, but most of the resorts and the beaches actually fared quite well. But it was like 80 uh, to 82 Fahrenheit and very humid every day. So I was wearing anywhere from three to four shirts a day as I would cycle (laughs) through my wet shirts from the humidity. But all in all, it was actually quite comfortable. Um, This will be shocking to you. Our second accommodations were actually right on the beach. And uh, we spent every night with just the windows open and the screens in. I actually didn't turn on the air con. It would get down to the high 60s at night. Wow. And yeah. So it was wow. It was actually beautiful. We fell in love with the place. We were in the house we stayed in after the resort stay in Puerto Vallarta is in this beautiful little spot in between Punamita and Puerto Vallarta called uh, Puto de Boros, which led to a lot of jokes because those of you that speak Spanish know that that is the point of the borough or the jackass. So we were set up for jackassery and that definitely happened. <laughs> Beautiful. Excellent. No, I'm glad to hear you had fun. I was I was thinking about you while you were away because I know your aversion to spending significant amount of time in these very hot weather climates, which it was I bad. much which I must prefer. Yeah, no, the humidity I know can can be uh can be quite a lot. But yeah, the uh, hot I'm glad. and dry I can handle. And it looked like I did see some photos. So it uh, it looked like there were some amazing festivities. And yes, our friend runs at 100 miles an hour at all times, which is actually, I think, in many ways good for you because uh, sitting still and being idle is also not something, as our audience knows, that is, is part of your DNA. So It is good for me, though. My wife, my wife yes. actually did get me to calm down for about an afternoon. We did a full on like get on the beach and lay, which was good. And the other thing that was really cool about it was it... um. I think it excited me even more for winter. I was seeing the weather back here. You know, we left right before a snowstorm and then it was gorgeous for a few days. And by the end, I can, I can tell you sitting at the Puerto Vallarta airport, right? Like near the tarmac, they always have that bar every, you know, I don't know who built all the airports in Mexico, but they're all the same. But it was the same person. And I think (laughs) they built them. They also built them in Maui, but they speak English there, but it's the same person. Well, the, the thing I'll say with the Mexico airports, though, is it's always like there's like they always set up a place where you can drink and be ready for your trip or ready to leave while sucking down intense amounts of van diesel. And so th- I was sitting there hot, sweaty, watching the Pats game on my phone. And I was like, yeah, it's ski season. It's time. Let's do this. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I'm ready. <laughs> Which is kind of funny because as I was sitting here in the snow, I was thinking, I really wish I was still on Maui because it really hadn't stopped snowing since we got back. So yeah, you and I are definitely, we're kind of, we're we're divergent in cross purposes. uh, Yes. But, but enough of us, I kind of hinted towards where we were going today, but we are actually going across the pond to Manchester, UK, home of the reds, home of the blues. For those of you who follow, who follow football, it's Manchester United and you know, the other team, I'm just going to say the other team from Manchester. (laughs) I'll let our, our letter guest, say that but i'm you I just can't I'm say the word away. city that's hard for you <laughs> it is because i'm i'm a big fan of uh, of united so our guest today is jamie Ryder. he is a copywriter who uses philosophy in his work to help brands forge their philosophy and connect to customers he is the founder of stoic athenium a platform for making ancient ideas new again and reframing mental health conversations He also runs Sexy Philosophy, a newsletter and community for business owners who want to embrace their own version of authenticity. Let's welcome in from across the pond where it's almost winter. Jamie, thank you so much for joining us today. Guys, thanks so much for having me on. I mean, just listening to that conversation there, it makes me want to take a holiday myself, just somewhere much warmer. But I've got the pleasure of your company today. So that's my environment for warmth with the ideas that we're going to share together. 
<laughs> Thank that you is so very much. Kind. Yeah. But yeah, but, get yourself down to the Algarve or something. It's not far. Yeah. <laughs> Mallorca or maybe even like take a flight over. I know Mauritius is, I've been there. Mauritius is kind of the, uh, is the tropical island destination for the UK and lots of Western Europe. So I've never been to the Mauritiuses. Are they beautiful? So I spent 36 hours on the Mauritius <laughs> islands when I was still in my New York days, I had to go over for a couple of tax meetings and the length of travel from New York to Mauritius and back was far, far longer than the time I actually spent on the island. But it it looked beautiful in between my bouts of document signing, cab rides, eating, and jet lag. That sounds, you know, usual for you at that time of life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, listening to your bio and, you know, I just realized I haven't updated this in forever, but if anyone's listening that has never checked in before or hasn't realized this, you know, they've come in sort of midstream, you know, the whole plan for this is Eric comes in as the informed party and I come in as the ignorant party. So listening to your bio, I just, I wonder how does one use philosophy to inform copywriting? I mean, I could make some really gross guesses that would probably be very entertainingly wrong, but we should just go to the source here, Jamie. Well, how do you do that? Yeah, it's a really interesting concept because to me personally, I think every business has some sort of philosophy or a set of values or what you stand for, whatever you want to call it. And copy and content is key to how you communicate that, particularly in trying to get a message across. But Philosophy for me is a deeper level was just something that's really helped my mental health on a personal level. And from coming from that industry for quite a number of years, that helped me make that connection for seeing it in that business sense and trying to live by certain values that I want to move forward with in my life as well and how it's helped me reframe a lot of things from that mental health context. Well, and and speaking of, you know, reframing mental health conversations, and I love how you have have put that as one of your key missions because it it dovetails really well with some what Mark and I are doing and also our collective friend Wizzy Magnuson who uh, is also helping to, you know, reframe and shatter the stigma as she likes to say one story at a time where one conversation at a time. But I I'd love to kind of jump in um a bit on your own mental health journey and how that eventually led you to the creation of your business and the newsletter, which I get. And I love, I love reading through it. Super informative. Yeah, no worries, Eric, because this is a story that's very personal to me. And there's a bit of a caveat. I'm going to share a story in the public space that I've never shared before really because I think these topics are very important anyway to actually make sure they resonate in the right way so from a very young age my mental health journey was I suffered on and off with social anxiety in the sense that it really sort of impacted how I felt inside and to try to deal with that from a young age as a teenager is quite traumatizing and that impacted me a lot of my life to the point where I actually contemplated trying to kill myself, which at the time was very painful. But now all these years later, I can look at it very objectively and say that that person is not who I am anymore. Yes, it happened, but I'm so much more than that. And to be able to say that openly without any judgment towards myself is just very liberating. And I think from that male perspective, it is very important to voice that in the public sphere. A few years later, towards actually saying that from a business perspective around the pandemic I was feeling quite burnt out and I needed something to reframe what I was doing because there was a lot of anxiety and that was kick starting my social anxiety again but philosophy was that thing and I'd never actually studied it when I was younger I'd heard about it but I'd never really dived into it until I started looking at it from the contemplation point of view of stoicism i started listening to podcasts reading books and diving down a really fun rabbit hole and then when the pandemic was kind of rolling down with the initial scare of it that really helped me move forward from that to the point when i was saying this has reinvigorated my love of copywriting as an industry but also from that mental standpoint it just made me feel so much more resilient and so much more capable of getting over things that i'd always think 
or had always su- suffered from in imagination, really. There's a quote from one of my favourite philosophers called Seneca, who says, we suffer more in imagination than we do in reality. And to me, that has certainly been the case of what I've looked at over the past couple of years and helped me to really just find that inner peace. So two things I want to unpack there. Actually, I'm going to start with how we often start when we hear a story like this, which is, thank you for staying. I am so honored to be having this conversation with you and am grateful to you that you figured out a way that we could have this opportunity today. So first off, thanks for that. And the two things I want to kind of unpack, and I don't care what order you do it in, they're related. So I'm just going to kind of say them both and, and see where you go is when I think of the word stoicism and the idea and the understanding of that philosophy, surface wise, it doesn't always lead, I think, to the conversation that you're interested in, right? Because the idea of stoicism is actually to be able to endure pain without the outward show of feelings or without complaint, right? And I know I, I know enough about it to know that there's a lot more meaning to it. It's deeper than that, especially from a philosophy standpoint. And then the quote from Seneca, I, it's funny, you said that. I was actually starting, I was, I couldn't remember. I was like, which philosopher had the quote? And I was like, I'm going to paraphrase about, you know, we suffer way more in our imagination or in our understanding of our experience, um, as he goes on to say later in that same piece, versus what's actually happening. And I was wondering how you think those two are so tightly wound together or where do they kind of untangle to allow you to find like a healthy sort of mindset? Yeah, it's really fascinating this because as I alluded to before with that experience, to me, there's always that distinction between little S stoicism and big S stoicism because the stereotype and the character trait is just being robotic and emotionless where it is that endurance. And yes, that has its place. But when I discovered the big S stoicism, the philosophy, I realized it was the opposite because I can look at my anxiety from an objective standpoint and say, yes, that has happened. But I can also now be open about it and be engaged with what I was feeling rather than just trying to push it aside and actually being engaged with people that speak about having open mental health conversations, trying to regulate emotions in an appropriate way. And then it's tying into the Seneca quote of suffering more in imagination than in reality, because it is that internal regulation and the certain practices within the school that are very easy to implement. But paradoxically, the not as well, it's just trying to find the right mindset to it as well. I love that description of it. And we're going to delve deeper into it and kind of how that dovetails with your newsletter. And But for our audience out there, and, and I know we've talked about it a bit and on the anxiety spectrum, but if you could give our audience a little bit more insight into kind of what that social anxiety for you, kind of how it presented, and if it's something that stays constant over time, or if, you know, as you got a bit older and into your you know, teenage years, if it started to get even worse. Yeah, absolutely. So the initial feeling was from an internal standpoint, it was this sort of paralysis on the chest. So outwardly, you might seem like everything's normal, but inside the way that I like to describe it, it's like being trapped in your own skin, really, where you're trying to look at it from the outside and Somebody might talk to you, but then your thoughts might be going haywire inside. You're like, oh, what am I trying to say? But then you feel like you're stuck. And then you tend to get more sort of uh, anxious about that because you assume objectively or probably not rationally, at least in my standpoint, that people are judging you based on your lack of answer or you might seem a bit standoffish or something. And throughout my teenage years that was certainly the case with how I felt but even into my early 20s as well because then it was in the workforce situation where at that standpoint I still wasn't very comfortable with trying to acknowledge that because obviously in a big corporate environment everything's fast-paced and people expect a certain level of work and standard as well which is perfectly understandable but equally you're still trying to find that balance as well but even towards my mid-20s as well that's when it started to get much easier to actually say, I can look back to objectively now and say in this context that this is how I usually feel and this is probably the best way that I can get across how those feelings make me feel sometimes, even if there's 
not necessarily rational from an outside perspective, but it is perfectly rational to the person who is going through that particular condition or that disorder. Absolutely. And it's interesting. <laughs> this is going to sound kind of harsh. So I don't I don't mean this in any way except to kind of shed a little light on my own experience and, and how it has similarities and differences from yours, Jamie. But I had a wonderful teacher and mentor when I was at university who is a stunning human in a lot of ways. But, you know, I opened up to him a bit about being depressed and having some performance anxiety. It wasn't social anxiety, performance anxiety as it related to being a theatrical performer and and a musician. And I just shared that, you know, I didn't want to disappoint anyone, you know, and, and just to clarify, I did make the point, especially myself, I didn't want to be disappointed in myself. And he was a bit of a Muppet and a character in some ways. And he just kind of leaned in and he said, you know, Fernandes, the problem is you think any of those people give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think, you know, as, as harsh as it may sound, I think it actually speaks absolutely to what you were talking about earlier of like, you know, that idea of, you know, what we imagine our suffering to be being so much more because he, he was absolutely right. Like, except for my teachers who were like, are trying to help me succeed and want to see me make growth and changes. And, you know, people who are close to me, who just want to see me succeed. Like 99.9% .9 of the people you run into are just like, you're just another face in the crowd, you you know, and, and not in a bad way. I don't mean that like, you know, you can obviously have a positive or a negative impact, but if you're not going to have a positive impact, it's better just not to have much of one, I think. So, and I'll never forget. Cause at the time I was pissed when he said that to me, like, you know, what the fuck? Like, Oh, so I don't matter. And he said, no, that's not what I mean. He's like, you don't matter to them. And I, and I, I was too young and I think too immature and probably am still too arrogant to really understand that in some ways. But it really is an important point of like understanding that lens of, you know, am I making too much of this? Am I, am I allowing myself to go down a road that actually isn't productive and is only going to make me feel worse in some ways? But and functionally won't change what I'm trying to do or not do. It's a crazy thought process, I think. I know. And I think, I think part of the issue, thinking through anxiety, hearing Jamie, you know, open up in a, in a brave way and, and kind of definitely honored that you're sharing your story on our, our podcast for the first time, hearing it and, and hearing what you experienced. It's all of those things kind of, you know, rolled into one. So there's the anxiety and then, and then there's the imposter syndrome. And then, and I think this is what you were alluding to, Mark, this, this idea of rather than just focusing on what we're doing, the anxiety comes from worrying about what everybody else is thinking. And so then the facade and the masks and, and then the spiraling thoughts of constantly, well, did somebody did somebody see what I'm like really like? And, and and before you know it, you're spending all your time worrying about how you're presenting yourself to the rest of the world. And they must be able to see what's going on inside of my head as though they have some sort of x-ray vision. Is that, am I kind of heading down the right path here, Jamie? Absolutely, Eric. And that really feeds into the idea with the newsletter about that level of authenticity, because authenticity is something that, I've really fixated on in the past couple of years anyway, because everybody's got their own version of it. And to be able to live by your beliefs or just to express your feelings in an open and a non-judgmental way is a very rare thing, I think. And once you feel completely comfortable with doing that, then I think that is your authentic self, regardless of, as Mark says, like people really don't give a shit at the end of the day. And that's beautiful, that, because then it's freeing once you finally understand that in the way that makes sense to you. No, and it's very true how you say that because I know Mark and I are both experiencing this in, in a positive way with what we're doing with the podcast and other things in the mental health space. And there is that distinction, right? Of people, people care deeply about what we're doing, right? From a mental health standpoint, but nobody, right? Cares about all of these other things that are spiraling around in my head or Mark's head, you know, at, at various points of the day and how we, how we think we may be perceived or, you know, it's, it's, it's always 
us as humans kind of blowing things out of proportion in comparison to the reality of what people are actually thinking. Well, and there's a freedom to it, right? And I'll share something. So I totally blew it. I wrote a meeting wrong in my calendar yesterday that Eric and I were having about the podcast. And and as I will, I felt terrible. Like I was beating myself up about it, whatever. And Eric was like, I was there. I, I got the stuff. We're good. And I was like, oh, bro, I can't believe. And and I made a couple of jokes. But then I realized that like perception wise, it ain't like if Eric really needed me there, he would have called me. He knows how to get in touch with me. Right. He probably thought something came up or something was going on that I couldn't get away from where in actuality, I was just an hour behind <laughs> in, in uh, which time zone I was in. And I'm actually wondering, actually, if the daylight savings versus not was what bit me. Because it, it was I was in a different time zone when the meeting was scheduled. I put it in my calendar and then it showed up an hour late for when it was actually was. So, so yeah, that that's a perfect example of you know, your perception versus the reality. And the uh, as you just said, the reality was knowing of with the other things you have going on, I thought, oh, Mark must have gotten caught up on this other thing. And, you know, if, if I really need him, I, I'll let him know. But yep. And then I felt like not, a, not a total deal. dipshit because I ran home like, brr, and then Eric said, no, that was an hour ago. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think the hardest thing for me at times is putting that responsibility on others, right? Like, if you're truly taking care of yourself and, and kind of paying attention to those things, you will, f at times, it'll feel, especially to someone like me, who's a bit of a people pleaser, it'll feel a little self-centered or selfish or a little inward facing, but you have to trust your partner, you know, your partner in business, your partner at home to be able to let you do that. And then when they need to break you out of it and be like, hey. Now's the time. Come on. I need you, you know? And so I think there is this balance to it of, you know, and, and I have so much trust for Eric that when he said that, I was like, oh, oh, I feel better. You know, like I could have versus spending the rest of the day and night beating myself up about it. And I think the other switch of it and listening to you talk about it, Jamie, and it, and it leads me to kind of what I'd like to hear more about is when, what helped you understand that you were actually like part and parcel to causing some of that anxiety internally versus external like how did you start to like untangle that yeah it's, it's really interesting because it goes back to the stoic practices really because i'd always try to find things that help me to try to make that distinction and philosophy was finally that thing because the beautiful thing about that philosophy is it's so simple on the surface with the practices that can be applied and i suppose it was the fact that it was doing them again and again because as an example with doing it over the pandemic a very simple thing is journaling right where you're just trying to constantly write down your thoughts and that's a basic exercise within that philosophy anyway and it was just literally writing down three positive things that happened in the day even when we were in the height of lockdown and but by doing that over and over over the months that just helped to create that positive habit and then by looking at other techniques such as the view from above which essentially is looking at that big picture view of a situation where if I look back at all the times where I might have felt that anxiety and then it's weird because I was trying to picture it in like a mental landscape but essentially if that anxiety is there to begin with it's taking a step outside yourself and then imagining if you're in your city or there's people around you who are probably going through the exact same thing whether they're anxious or they're having a bad day with the job or whatever and then going a step further by imagining you're looking down at the entire world and you're part of that wider thread of humanity and then slowly coming back down into yourself and then the idea is that hopefully once you've done all that you can defuse whatever you were feeling because against the grand scheme of things it probably wasn't that big of a deal so that view from above exercise is something that I like to apply day to day if I'm feeling that particular uh, trigger of anxiety I really like that. Yeah, I was going to say, I like that view from above because I know with a lot of therapists as well, they'll do exercises where it's as though you're watching yourself on a movie screen. And so you're in the audience and you're watching sort of how it plays out. And I think hearing you talk about it, I think what that really helps to do, and it gets back to what Mark said earlier, is it helps you recognize 
that all of these other people are walking by and getting into a, a cab or getting onto the subway and they're just going about their lives, right? They're not focused on you. They're not looking at you. They're not thinking about you, even though, right, we're, we're programmed in that anxiety world to think everyone's thinking about us and talking about us. And, and I like how you talk about, and then you're able to bring yourself very slowly back into your own body and then have that safety and security and understanding, okay, this is just a thought and that thought isn't an action or a reality. I think the other really important bit of this, Jamie, which is really cool is it isn't immediately dismissive, right? Like even sometimes cognitive behavioral therapy and this idea of reframing, to the uninitiated or at the beginning can seem like, oh, you're not seeing what's really going on there. You've got to find this where that practice that you just brought forth, if there really was something going on that you should be worried about, it gives you the time and the sort of, for lack of a better term, the permission to be like, oh, no, 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 Sh shit is awry. I, I need, there, there's something over here that I have to contend with because if you're feeling it on the ground level and you see it from the 30,000 foot view, it's like, no, 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 uh, you know, we got to recalibrate the GPS and get this shit sorted out versus like, and, and, and I'm not suggesting that those other things are patently dismissive. They could just feel that way, right? Where what you just described, I think has an inclusion of that in there of like, no, 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 I'm going to take a functional look at what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, and then try to look at what it looks like, not just from within, but from without. And I think that's such an important distinction to have. Indeed. And I think the key for me is that action of delaying really, because objectively, again, you can think that shit might be going in all different directions, but if you just try and think of that delaying exercise, if like certain feelings well up, then it is just that step back. And then it, to me, that key is the discernment where you can discern again, reality or imagination. And again, it might not always be easy to, do that in the moment but if you've got something that you can do like write something down or try to change your environment that might help as well so again very small practices which again might sound very easy on paper but just trying to actually be cognitively aware of them at least certainly for my own situation that that can be the difference sometimes well and how yeah. often is it and, and Eric, you could answer this as well I, as my as my uh, in-house anxiety expert. How often is it that just recognizing the thing is enough? Like you're like, oh, like I feel anxious because blank. And then all of a sudden you're like, eh. <laughs> right? Is that often like, can that often be the case? I know with Eric, sometimes it can be. I've heard him be like, yeah, I was really anxious. And then I went and then I said it out loud or, you know, there's some recognition aspect that really changes things sometimes, doesn't it? Well, I think, yeah, for me, and then love to hear from Jamie. I, th I think for me, it's, it's a three part equation. It's recognizing. And sometimes it's not right away. We've talked about this a lot on the show, but recognizing that, okay something is off. And that's how I kind of think about it now in my own head. Like something is a bit off. What is it and why? And once I have that, then it's okay, let me, I'm going to write that down, right? As Jamie was saying with journaling. So now I've got it on paper, right? So it helps to get that out. But then the third piece for me is then telling somebody. So whether it's telling my wife, telling a close friend, and I feel like once those three steps have been taken, uh, you know, it, I'm not going to say I'm suddenly like back to 100%, right? It's, you know, I've moved back into a place where those thoughts are not overwhelming me. The anxiety is not overwhelming me and I'm able to then recognize it and live with it. And then within a very short period of time, it's all sorts of, it sort of fades away and I can move on with my, with my life. How about for you, Jamie? Yeah, it's really interesting because that gives me an idea around another technique that I like to use in the sense that it's preparing for those situations where anxiety might crop up, which is the premeditation of adversity, which is attributed to Seneca, where essentially it is thinking about what the worst case scenario might be, but not to be that negative. It's about trying to build up that well of resilience. So in a practical example for me, it's saying, 
if I'm going into an environment where I know I'm going to be anxious, then what would I do to try to prepare? How could I deal with that? So say if I was going to do some public speaking, then if I was in that environment, how would I feel? Would I feel like tight in my chest? How would I get over that? Would I do breathing exercises? So it's doing that over and over. And then by the time you're in that situation, then you've rehearsed it a number of times. So like, oh, remember when I was thinking about that? This is what I should do. So it's pre-preparing really. And I found that very useful as well. And I'm curious, as you've become more open and talked more about this, have you have you had a chance now to chat with with friends from over the years and kind of as you explain to them you know this is what i was living with have they had any insights into like oh that's why that makes sense now that's why you were the way you were or did people were you so good as many of us are at being able to hide it that nobody even picked up on any of the signs I think it was a balancing really because for context, I'd always been open with it with my family anyway. So I always had that, you know, space to be like that and be open. And with certain friends as well, they'd see me like that since childhood. But it, it's very paradoxical again with strangers as well. It was that aspect of sometimes having that facade and thinking about not talking about it, but now in the last five years it's just been so easy to just say it without any level of judgment and then just say it in this the service of trying to be more open in that wider thing of just breaking down that stigmas as we're all here to do today well and i wonder and this is something i feel is breaking down that stigma externally does a huge bit of work internally right have you noticed that sort of even your own judgment of yourself has changed oh yeah absolutely because if you told me jamie of 10 years ago if he'd be doing this then you probably wouldn't have believed me but just the fact that every time i have a conversation like this then it breaks down that internal barrier and it just brings me out back out into the external world if that makes sense absolutely it does i mean i i shared this before but it's been a long time you know when eric and i first started on this journey of having the podcast i had a very close family member call me and be like how come i didn't know you were depressed i was like well i didn't know that telling you would change anything right and and i know now right and and not like in a negative way but you know it was one of those things where when you're suffering from any of these things in silence i think the thing is is you know eric's journey was very much at times actively hiding like you know he was afraid that if people found out like how would they judge him and and i'll be honest mine was different where it wasn't necessarily actively hiding it i just i didn't know that it would even help to say anything if that makes sense of the difference no it definitely does and something that i think really helped my personal journey as well is looking at certain shows or examples in pop culture where it's very easy for it to be articulated and a show that really made a difference for me was Bojack Horseman I'm not sure if you're familiar with that but essentially it's about a talking horse which sounds like really just what what is that on paper but it's actually very nuanced because it's set in a world where celebrities are you know the be all and end all but they suffer with the depression the the aspects of not getting everything they want or they do get everything they want and they're still not happy. And it's all filtered through Bojack, who is a washed up sitcom star who basically got everything he wanted from a very early age, but he's he's still very self-loathing and he's still very depressive. But the episodes in that animated form just really drill down into what the thoughts of somebody who's anxious or what the thoughts of somebody who's depressed is really like. And it's just, so profound from a storytelling perspective but in that very animated and kitschy style it just helps people articulate what they may have may have felt for a multitude of different reasons i love that i've never heard of it and i want to be able to make sure that we get that in our show notes is that a is it a uk based show and and is it something that can be seen on like you know hulu or netflix or anything uh for our audience to be able to take a look. I know I want to watch. 
Yeah, well, it's on Netflix, BoJack Horseman, and there's two episodes that I would highly recommend. One is called Stupid Piece of Shit, where <laughs> but literally, because BoJack Love in it. the episode thinks of himself as a stupid piece of shit because he's suffering from depression, but in his head, you actually see the thoughts that he spirals to actually get him to there. And there's, a, there's another one called Free Churro, where BoJack is giving a eulogy about his mum, and all he does is for 20 minutes, he just sort of articulates how his parents made him feel and why he was the way he was and how he got to be where he was. So it is just phenomenal, the level of acting and nuanced storytelling there. Yeah, this that's amazing. Well, and I haven't seen those episodes. I've seen bits of it because the way I would describe it for our American audiences is, is first off, it is a little too accurate to what the world looks like right now. But, you know, we had a very famous television horse way back in the day here, the famous Mr. Ed, the talking horse. And it was like, imagine if you took Mr. Ed and all of these like child stars, and then, you know, we revisit them as adults. And unfortunately, there is this arc, right? Like, it's it's almost an accepted arc. Like, if you meet so much success at such a young age, and it's like, well, where do you come from there? And I think that aligns perfectly with what you've chosen as sort of your overriding philosophy of big S stoicism, which is, you know, all of those material success trappings are just that they're indifferent, like, you know, and please help me if I screw this up, but it's wisdom. Like the four tenets are wisdom, courage. There's two more hit me. Yeah. Justice. Justice. Yeah. Uh, so you said justice, wisdom, temperance, and courage. Ah, I miss temperance. Uh, temperance, also known in American parlance as moderation, and we suck at it. Um, <laughs> and and when I say we, there is an I and we. There is... <laughs> Eric, laugh all you want. It's fine. Yeah. I, I no, it's... It. <laughs> and I think it's something I've pushed myself really hard to come to terms with as someone who has had some like outward material successes in certain ways and not in others and how little that has to do with who we are as people. And it's really hard because society does not push us in that direction. You know, it's not, Oh, you just won the championship. How do you feel? It's what are you going to do now? That's what they say. Right. And it's like that question alone is so fucking harmful. <laughs> it's like, you know, where it really should be like, I would really, you know, I'd love to hear how you feel and are you, which loved ones are you going to go celebrate with? And, you know, those are the questions we should be asking, not what's next. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And something I, I'm curious about. So, you know, we, when we talk about mental health conversations, Mark and I, you know, it's about shattering. We talk about upending conversations and upending the space and, and you, say it in, in a way kind of reframing mental health conversations. I'd love to hear uh, kind of how you came about that and and what you mean by reframing mental health conversations. Yeah, because it's a very expansive idea that, and I mean it in a few ways because I, I have spoken a little bit about pop culture here and that is one version of reframing because depending on the person, it might not always be easy to articulate the way we feel or try to put like the idea of it. So to me personally, I like to look at examples of people in pop culture, like in Bojack Horseman or with superheroes and Marvel, for example, where you've got these really larger than life characters, but they seem to have so much, you know, laser focused accuracy on the, they might feel these particular things around anxiety and depression. And then it makes it relatable then because if, characters like that feel these things and surely it's okay for normal people to feel like this way as well another version of reframing is with the philosophy saying that no matter what you do in a normal situation these ideas from ancient schools of thought like stoicism or epicureanism or something like existentialism as well there's a lot of crossovers here with psychology and philosophy here that it doesn't really matter the theory behind them because to me, I don't think there's a huge difference between academic philosophy, i.e. studying it versus philosophy is something that's meant to be lived. And that's what I make the key distinction here where it's living what you believe, applying these lessons rather than just, you know, philosophizing in an armchair for a degree. That's not what I'm interested in. It's actually trying to bring it down to earth. 
which which to be clear is what those philosophers were doing you know and i think we lose a little bit of that right like and psychology itself is essentially a philosophy in science for better living and better understanding of how our brains interact with our bodies and with everyone else so i think what you speak to is important and i think the other bit of it is we are as humans amazing at reinventing the wheel you know, we love to be like, oh, this is the new thing, man. This is the new shit. Let's go. And it's like, no, like from a genetic standpoint and like how we feel and how we interact with the people in the world around us, like 2000 years is a long time from technology, but not from a corporeal and mental being like that stuff still applies. I feel a bit sad, you know, because the Greeks beat us to everything. They basically discovered the meaning of life just 2,000 years ago. So where do we go from here, really? Yeah. And and I think a lot of people nowadays are starting to look back and think, I want to participate in a life that is more similar to what the Greeks were living 2,000 years ago. I know lots of people are are starting to migrate themselves off of social media. They're starting to change their work habits, right? They're, they're, uh, you were talking about temperance. They're, they're starting to moderate some things in their life so that they have more time to be able to be present for themselves, whether that's reading or writing or uh, something else, you know, we're going to talk about kind of forest bathing, uh, but being out in nature and rather than just like being constantly blasted by things that really may not have any any real impact on their day-to-day lives. So I think as as we're getting, you know, sort of towards the end of this and starting to wrap up, I, I want to ask you, Jamie, sort of this is going to sound weird. And and we could cut this if it gets too weird, but I would love to hear just your personal sort of, you know, you can share a personal story of how you put this philosophy into work. And I feel like too often, you know, it's, it sounds so simple, right? Like you've mentioned journaling or different things, but I'm guessing, and if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but I'm guessing you're not just journaling or not just reflecting that you're actually using these four tenants or, you know, some sort of a lens to judge through. And I just love to hear how that shows up and what that looks like. Yeah, absolutely. One thing that comes to mind is to me, a little bit of what I do with work is this thing called fulfillment stories, but a fulfillment story for me while trying to live those four stoic principles around mental health is there was a situation a couple of months ago where there was a guy on LinkedIn who I'd never met in person, but he's he seemed to be struggling with his mental health as well. And I basically just sent him like a direct message to say, mate, look, I don't I don't know you, but are you OK? Like there are people here that you can talk to. And we basically had a little bit of a back and forth thing of just saying, you know, you seemed OK after it. And my fulfillment story in that was it, it just felt like the right thing to do because I can talk about these things under the sun all day. But if I'm not actively trying to apply them day to day, then to me, that is just talking I love that story because I think it gets to the heart of why we're all doing what we're doing, right? We've, we've all, you know, moved through and continue to move through our own personal journeys, but there's a reason that we have those journeys and it's so that we can then be able to, as you did with your story, Jamie, you were able to reach out to this person who you suspected was struggling. He was, you know, giving all sorts of hints and things on the LinkedIn platform, uh, which probably most people would never have picked up on. But having been in that similar situation, you noticed that and and you were able to reach out and, and make a difference. And I think at the end of the day, that's what we're all trying to be able to do is by providing providing you know platforms where people can share these stories, they'll help other people find their voices and be able to make some real positive change in other people's lives. I agree 100 percent and to me it is just being able to create those spaces where people can have those conversations and whether it's physical or intangible, it's just being able to tease it out of somebody or just make them feel comfortable to open up in the way that makes sense to them. That's so beautifully said, Jamie. And I think, you know, 
sometimes I feel like Eric and I are a little too attached to inflammatory language, right? We love, like he mentioned earlier, we want to disrupt, we want to explode, we want to shatter. And, and, and we do, but it is often in those sort of quiet moments, leaving space, an invitation. You know, one of the exercises that we were supposed to do for this meeting yesterday was 10 words of like what our podcast is about and what we're trying to do. And I absolutely went right to like scorched earth. Like the, all the words I was like, yeah, we want to like fire, destroy, break, burn. And it's like, yes, all of that is true. But sometimes the best way to do that is to just put the matchbook in front of someone, <laughs> right? Like you don't have to come to the house with a flamethrower, they might not open the door. <laughs> and, and they probably shouldn't, because you've got a fucking flamethrower, man. Um, <laughs> but but I do, and and I and I love I love that language. And I also love just the sense of how important that is for the person to just know, you know, and I'm gonna misparaphrase you, but essentially what you're saying is like, I'm here. Like when you're ready, like, you know, and, and, and it's wonderful to be able to do that. And look, sometimes we can't always do that, right? There are times where we see someone who's truly in crisis and we might have to show up, bang down the door, get in there and, and do it. And, and look, if that's the case, that's the case, but all too often the conversation does need to start with a quiet moment or with uh, an invitation to that versus a uh, sledgehammer <laughs> invitation. But I, and so I really appreciate not only that reminder, but your just forthwith and, and it feels right. Right. And that's the thing. Like it, it can't, it can't feel like something that doesn't feel appreciated or right to the person or they won't, and like they won't want to, they, you know, they are, we already feel sort of, bad enough or forced enough or or wounded enough to like you know if if it's too much then it would be difficult and 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 i guess it leads me to another question is when you think about you know how you sort of went about this and we um i'm excited to share bojack horseman with people and you know the couple of episodes i saw were hysterical i just i just didn't keep up watching it um i think it was one of the first animated things ever on netflix it might have even been like the very first because I think it started in the early, it was like 13 or 14. But I was just wondering, like, if someone's very interested, obviously, we've got your website up there, stoicathenium.com. But what are some other things that you've read, or you've sort of, whether it's movies, books, or whatever, that have helped you and kind of informed you? If someone's listening out there, and they're like, hey, Jamie's on it, like, this is the pulse of where I'm at, you know, where would you steer people towards? Yeah, there's a couple of stoic books that I'd always recommend from that mental health perspective. There's a great one called How to Think Like a Roman Emperor by Donald Robertson. He's a CBT therapist who basically puts the reader in the mind of Marcus Aurelius, the stoic emperor, and seeing how that those practices are applied and how you can do it in a modern day. There's also Breakfast with Seneca by David Fadilla, who basically looks at Seneca's ideas from that wider mental health context as well. And another philosophical book I'd recommend is How to Live a Life of Montaigne, who was a French philosopher who applied loads of different things. And he's such a hilarious philosopher as well, because that feeds into my idea of philosophy being sexy as well. You can have a laugh at it. It's not all dour and grimness. It's love and laughter and life and sex. So, yeah, it's, it, that book feeds all of that, if that floats your boat. <laughs> I couldn't remember the name of that philosopher, so I'm really glad you brought that up because I remember being exposed to him in philosophy classes in college, and even my buttoned-up, you know, velvet-elbowed philosophy professor was like, we're going to have some fun this week. And I was like... I mean, he said that, and I was like, this guy's full of shit. Also, his version of fun is not my version of fun. And he was like, can you imagine, you know, an absinthe and drunk-filled rage leading to philosophy? And I was like, my ears were like, ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> and so, it, but I think, and I think that is an important thing to look at is like, how do we take these concepts, right? Because really that's what it is, right? Like whether it's philosophy or new age thought, like put whatever air quotes around it. And how do we find the things that will help us live to be our better version of ourselves? Like, I mean, that's really like, what else is knowledge for, right? We should, we should make better houses, better food, 
take better care of each other and feel better, right? Like that, that's what, you know, like all these things, as I sit here surrounded by a bunch of devices that just make me want to smash them with a hammer half the time, that's what the shit is supposed to be doing, right? <laughs> it is the idea of knowledge versus wisdom for me, because to me, knowledge is something you're, all, you're always subsuming and acquiring, but wisdom is actually putting it into practice for the right reasons. Such a beautiful way. Yeah. Way to say that. And, and I would also highly suggest that when you go to uh, Jamie's website, you also sign up for the sexy philosophy newsletter. I get it and read it and lots of great stuff in there. And for sure you are reframing the mental health conversations just through, through your words, both spoken and written. So I thank you for that. Well, and listening to you talk about it, you know, I, I could tell where you came to it, but walk me through the day that Jamie was like, I need to write the sexy philosophy newsletter. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great question. And it, and it started with alcohol, as all good stories do. Uh, <laughs> it is the thing. I, so I was having a point. <laughs> Yeah, something like that. It was it was not it was not beer. I think it was rum or whiskey at the time. But essentially, I'm a huge drinks nerd, and to me, that just feeds my creative energy anyway. And it's just being able to come up with these really off the wall ideas at the right times. And it started from this idea of just trying to something a bit quirky because when people think sex in philosophy, they're like, "What the hell is that?" And then it's just. It's, it's kind of that disarming thing. And then it just opens up the door for, you know, mental health, practical things, and just trying to, you know, put, take uh, sort of not necessarily always talked about subjects and just trying to make them more authentic and open. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Well. Cause, and that's often how it happens, right? People are, people are drawn to the unique. It's just like why I know a lot of people are drawn to the macabre. It's like things that like, you're like, oh, that's a world that like never really heard about that before. Like, let me let me plunge into that a little bit. And and you've done that with with your newsletter. It's uh it's a really it is a really cool title. I love it. I love it. Anything we'd like to share as we wrap up here, boys? I think we gotta we got some good reading suggestions. We have a way for people to get in touch with you through your website, Jamie. Anything else you'd like to add? Well, guys, I just want to say thank you to you because I love the fact that you are trying to disrupt the conversation in a really wholesome but really realistic way as well and keep doing what you're doing because the more people you have on from multiple backgrounds, the more perspectives you're going to get. And just thank you for having me on. I've really loved being here today. Thank you. It was absolutely our pleasure. I'm so glad Wizzy was able to connect us and uh, we're drawing, you know, so many, so many amazing connections with our friends in the UK and right back at you continue doing what you're doing and, and reframing mental health conversations and integrating all of this amazing philosophy that was written down, you know, hundreds of centuries before any time we walked the earth and and as you said you know using the wisdom to be able to to reframe how we even think about mental health but how we put it to practice for ourselves and for others and uh, and I look forward to to many more fun conversations to come truly thank you so much and it reminds me of one of my uh, dad's favorite quotes that he would always remind me of is that a smart man learns from his own mistakes. And in speaking to what Eric just talked about, that all of this stuff's been written down long ago, a wise man learns from the mistakes of others. And, <laughs> and being able to draw on these thousands of years of the human experience. And, and we stand sort of on the cusp of it, I think, right? Like our world, uh, the way we interact with each other in our world has changed so much that I do think it is really, it, there is no better time for us to reflect on where we came from and how uh, we've been successful at this before. So Jamie, thank you so much for that. So on behalf of myself, Mark Fernandes, and my co-host, Eric DeRosa, this is From Survivor to Thriver, our wonderful guest, Jamie Ryder. Thank you for joining us here for episode 107. And I will leave us with these words, as I always do. Let's please all be as well as we can. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe to our show and leave us a review. Also, 
We'd love if you could share this episode with a friend and encourage you to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or email via the links in our show notes. See you next week.